Okay, I am Vineshan. I I lead you know open power ecosystem and enablement worldwide, and I do work with uh, worldwide universities as well as academicians you know for a lot of collaborations. And today uh, I have uh, Oak Ridge as well as Lawrence River uh, to give you know a sh a introduction about this summit and Sierra systems, and also the various uh, you know the architecture involved around the system. Okay, and uh, I have here customers, you know, the national uh, lab customer from Taiwan, NCSC, and also the Prince Princeton University uh, from New Jersey, right? Okay, nice so to meet you. Welcome nice you all. Nice to meet you. Yeah, welcome you all. And um, uh, I have uh, Rob Nile, he's the key architect for Sierra, uh, the world uh, third largest supercomputer. And he's going to be sharing. Second. Second, Second largest. This morning. As of today. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wow. Hot off the press. That's a good one. <laughs> yes. That's well, a good press. <laughs> it's a team effort. So. Yeah. <laughs> we moved up. Yeah. Yeah. Second Number one is Super two. Two. And, you know, and he's a key architect for that. He's here right now to share his experiences. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm actually more on the application side, not the, the uh, hardware architecture side. But where I sit at Livermore, I kind of try to keep a foot in you know, the research division, the applications division, where I'll talk about, as well as in the computing center that, that deploys this system. But, uh, yeah, as just mentioned, we're hot off the presses, the uh, number two system. Uh, we probably should go number one or number two, but I have to get out of here in quarter row. So we're going to do this a little bit backwards. But uh, the Summit system that Jarek will talk about and Sierra are uh, related architectures, but there's a couple differences. Uh, that I'll point out when we get into to some of the details. So the slides I have, they're a bit of a mishmash of various things I tried to pull together, not knowing exactly where the audience was here, but in particular I want to talk about a couple open applications that uh, we've been pursuing. So just by way of introduction, Lawrence Livermore, uh, we're out on the west coast in the Bay Area of California. Um, this is our, our site, it's about a square mile site with 8,000 or so employees. Um, but we're, we're a national security laboratory. Um, Oak Ridge is really focused on the open science mission. Our applications and the machines that we buy are more, they'll, they'll, Sierra will end up on the classified, so, so I can't talk too much about some of the specific applications, but what we do is before, you know, while the machine is being shaken out, it, it's on the open side, and we also have an unclassified system that's a little bit smaller. But just by way of, uh, just, this is the last introduction to the lab, um, we've got a number of, of national security missions, everything from basic high energy density science, which um, the National Ignition Facility is one of our large laser facilities at the lab, so we do a lot of computer modeling to understand that. Things like uh, additive manufacturing, biosciences, uh, earthquake modeling, and of course just basic you know, nuclear science and materials modeling. All that at the lab is really pinned on uh, these HPC systems that we deploy. So, Really high performance computing touches all of the, the missions out at, at Livermore. So Sierra, these are some, some very fluffy high level marketing slides, but um, this is our new 125 petaflop system. That's peak number. Um, I think the R max was somewhere around 94 or something like that, so a pretty good number. Um, like I said, it supports the national security mission. Um, and a quick overview of the system. Um, so, of course, it's uh, IBM Power9 processors. Uh, each node has two of those, and our system has four GPUs per, mo per node, so a two-to-one ratio of uh, GPU to CPU. That's one of the key differences with Summit. Summit has uh, an extra two GPUs per node. Um, and I can, t I can talk later, if you wish, about you know, some of those trade-offs and why we made that decision. Um, but part of it was, this is our first foray, unlike Oak Ridge, into <coughs> GPU computing. So we've done a massive shift of our application base over the last three, four years, really, to get ready for this system. Oak Ridge had Titan before that. They've had a little more experience with this. But, you know, having a nice, very powerful serial core like the Power 9 was something that we deemed as important for those parts of our applications that maybe didn't, you know, weren't able to completely port to the GPUs. Um, the other reason being uh, memory bandwidth for us is very important and if, when you add that third GPU you're splitting a fixed amount of bandwidth on NVLink across an additional component so we, we want to keep the overall memory bandwidth up a little bit higher. 
Um, lots of memory uh, on, on board, and uh, each node also has some non-volatile memory as well that we're beginning to learn how to use initially for checkpointing and restarting, but you know, very quickly we're shifting toward figuring out how to use things like memory map tools to extend the memory space and use that for learning algorithms and, and you know, ex extended memory. So overall, the system is just over uh, 4,300 nodes. We've got a two-to-one tapered Mellanox uh, InfiniBand network. That's another difference with Oak Ridge. They have a full fat tree. Uh, we tapered um, on the top switch to, to save a little money there. Uh, that was after we did some analysis of our applications and you know the bisection bandwidth was not a bottleneck for us. So we could taper that, that network and still see um, you know, the, the performance we needed. Also, a lot of our workload tends to be things like ensembles and uncertainty quantification where we're not always running across the entire machine. We're running, you know, a large number of more localized jobs. That's, that's part of our workflow, not the whole thing. Um, but when, you, when you're running that kind of job, mix, the, uh, the tapering doesn't, doesn't impact you as much. So, I don't know if there's much new I can say here. This is what the actual node looks like on the Sierra system. So over 17,000 uh, GPUs total, uh, so that 4,300 nodes times, times the four. Um, we have run some calculations that I'll talk about that have utilized that entire machine and gotten some pretty amazing results. So very uh, excited about the performance we're seeing. Um, the interconnect is proving to be uh, uh, pretty robust. The CPUs are uh, new to us. We haven't had any power CPUs at Livermore. Uh, we had blue gene systems and still have a blue gene Q system, but not, not something quite as powerful as the Power 9. We dabbled with some of the Power 7s in the past, but so this is a new architecture for us that we're learning about. And then I already talked a little bit about, about some of the memory. Are you hyper-threading those? Uh, Starting to, and that's part of what we're trying to evaluate is what are the benefits there. You know, it's a very complex core, and to eke out all those features is going to require a lot of exploration. Honestly, a lot of our initial work has just been, can we utilize the GPUs because so much of the performance is coming from there that, you know, getting a factor of 30% or 50% better on the CPU overall doesn't make a huge dent. But we'll get there, and we're starting to do some, some studies, but I don't have any detailed results for you. Probably everybody here uh, knows, knows about the Power 9 processor, but a uh, pretty impressive piece of silicon. Um, the, the epitome of the, the fat core. Um, and then, of course, the NVIDIA Volta is a, is a uh, pretty impressive GPU as well. So we, we saw quite a bit of uh, performance improvement over an earlier Pascal-based system that we had. So we had what we call uh, an early access system. Oak Ridge had a similar one, uh, which was the Power 8 with the initial NVLink 1 and the uh, Pascal GPUs. We used that for a year and a half or so to just help us start to understand the software stack and the hardware. Um, but when we moved to the, to the Power 9 Volta, we saw a pretty, uh, pretty good jump in, in performance, largely because of some of the better memory bandwidths. Um, but also, it's just it's a much more powerful uh, GPU. So just where are we, status of things? So we accepted the system uh, about uh, six weeks ago or so, right at the end of September, and had a big dedication. Uh, October 26th, so if you Google LLNL Sierra, you'll find all kinds of press announcements and that sort of thing, because we did our big rollout uh, at the end of October. Um, we're currently in what we call an open science campaign mode. The machine sits on an unclassified network in the wide open so that we can work with the community and shaking things out. Uh, and I'll talk about what, what some of the applications are that we run while it's in that mode. And we're scheduled to, to go into uh, general availability or, or what we call production mode within the center uh, in about four months or so, a little less. I think we're going we're gonna to take it offline in, in January, recable it for the, the classified network. It's an air-gapped network. Um, and then it will get transitioned over uh, in support of what's the ASC program, for those who don't know, in the Department of Energy. That's the Advanced Simulation and Computing Campaign for the three uh, NNSA labs, Los Alamos, Livermore, and uh, San Diego. So this machine is co-owned by those three laboratories. So San Diego and Los Alamos will have equal access to this machine for purposes of uh, supporting their mission as well. 
But since I can't talk too much about that, let me talk about some of the stuff we've done. This, this is a little bit out of date, and I don't know if you've got anything on the cancer moonshot in, in your stuff, but we'll talk about the, the Pilot 2 piece here. Um, I think you guys are involved in Pilot 3, um, so I don't know if you're yeah. going to talk no, about I'm not that. Talking, no. But long story short, the, this cancer moonshot, that's kind of a nickname that's, that's stuck, came out of the, the National Strategic Computing Initiative in the U.S. Uh, when was that? Back in 2014. But what it did was give some cover for the Department of Energy with all its great supercomputers to start working with other agencies in applying uh, supercomputing to other missions. And in this case, uh, we got connected with the National Cancer Institute here in the U.S. And through some conversations with them, basically boiled down to what are your top three challenging problems? Um, and let's see if we can tackle those with, uh, with some new supercomputing technologies. So something called Pilot One is a uh, uh, more sort of big data uh, type project uh, run out of uh, Argonne. Um, Pilot Three uh, is again more sort of data focused. Um, and then Pilot Two is what I'll talk about here. And this is really understanding uh, sort of some of the underlying mechanism and path biological pathways for these RAS, RAS uh, proteins and how, so, so in cancer, uh, the RAS protein, and I'm not an oncologist or anything close to it, so uh, those who are experts in this field, correct me if I get this wrong, but the RAS protein is the protein that's really responsible to tell a cell when to divide, right? And so cancer is basically unchecked growth and splitting, you know, turns into a tumor. Um, but some of these RAS proteins in certain kinds of cancers, we really have no good basic understanding of, you know, how these things basically get in, in, in such a mode where they don't turn off and growth, growth grows uh, uncontrolled. And so, you know, as a result, this is a particularly nasty kind of set of cancers that we're tackling here that are some of the most challenging. Uh, pancreatic cancer, you know, if you've ever, you know, unfortunately known anyone who has it, it's, it's not something that has a good success rate of, you know, recovering from. It's a particularly nasty cancer. Um, same with uh, colon and, and certain uh, lung cancers. So there's a bunch of, there's a number of different kinds of cancers. These are the ones that are uh, particularly vexing for the biologists in, ah, thank you, in understanding how to, I've got a. You can advance with that. Oh, I see, you just stuck. Yeah. Okay, I have to get rid of all the notes here. Um, so again, really just trying to understand the, the basic pathways. And so one key thing that's interesting about this is that because we're teamed up with the real biological scientists at the Cancer Institute and some of their supporting partners, we've got an experimental basis that, that is part of this as well. And this is right out, you know, this is a chapter out of some of the best supercomputing missions. You want some, some experiment to help confirm your simulations so that you know when you're getting the right answer. And likewise, you want simulations to inform how to establish your experiments. And so this is something that in the, you know, DOE community we do all the time, but it's a new, new thing for some of these other uh, areas. So this has been a really interesting and fun, fun project to work with them. And then, let's see if I can maybe skip ahead instead of going into, well, let me just say, the, the core of this in, in the analysis, this is a uh, physics simulation, molecular dynamics simulation. But if you know anything about molecular dynamics, you get very small time steps. And so, so to run any sort of calculation that spans you know, seconds would take you know, millions and millions of time steps. And it's really untractable. So the way we're approaching this, because we need to run large time scales to understand how these proteins are interacting with cell membranes, uh, we're running a multi-scale molecular dynamics code. So there's a continuum phase field code that's spawning a number of, uh, uh, not quite first principles, but molecular dynamics uh, simulations. And we've got some machine learning in the loop here too, which uh, I'll show how all this fits together. So just repeating what I said, we've, you know, this is a cartoon picture, but we've got a, a continuum scale uh, for the cell membrane running with a phase field code. And then when we get down to the molecular level, uh, how that's penetrating, we, we uh, spawn off some uh, molecular dynamics. Now, I'm not even going to attempt to talk through this, but this is just to demonstrate that 
This, this was a particularly interesting calculation because it really exemplified the concept of workflow. IBM talks a lot about workflow. We're starting to talk about workflow. And what that means to us anyway is we're not just dumping a big solver on the system and cranking through PDEs. We're spawning new jobs. We're putting machine learning in the loop. Um, it's, it's a much more complex way to manage and schedule jobs on your systems. But it's, you know, in our opinion, this is the, you know, this is the future of high performance computing is how can you tie all these things together into a same, same kind of workflow. So, you know, again, I'm not going to try to, to step through this, but let's see, I think, yeah, there's a movie here. Basically, you know, as this is running, what's, you know, this is a, a phase field calculation running at a couple different levels. There's a machine learning uh, algorithm that's looking where, quote, interesting things are happening. And I don't, I'm not going to try to define what interesting means here. But there are things that we can't calculate this accurately with this continuum code. We need to spawn a uh, molecular dynamics simulation uh, to, to get the results there. Feed that back uh, in real time to the continuum code. Learn about that. What did we learn from that? And use that in the, the training set to, to inform the, the multi-scale going forward. So, like I said, it's a pretty complex workflow. We ran this back in March when the machine was just plugged together, not quite stable, and a lot of the software was, uh, was not yet uh, stable, so it was a pretty heroic effort back at the time. Uh, they, they did this in March uh, for a Gordon Bell submission that didn't make a finalist, but they're, they're uh, currently rerunning this now with a little bit more stable software stack and some, some better optimized MD um, as well. So I think this just says what I uh, said. You, you, you find in interesting area and spawn off a uh, molecular dynamic simulation here so that you can do some, some detailed calculations and feed that back. So uh, this was really our first big application that we ran. Um, the, the updated data is similar, but we're, we're just getting more confident with the results. Um, but some, some statistics up here uh, on how this was run. And we do feel that this is going to start to give us some real insight into uh, you know, biological pathways for these RAS proteins. So the second application I'm going to talk about is, um, this is not a terribly interesting calculation on its own. It's a really tailored instability calculation. So uh, fluids with different densities, how do they, they interact over time? And you'll see when I have a, um, a movie later on, uh, you know, how this plays out. But this is important to us in the NNSA uh, for an area called inertial confinement fusion, which uh, we have a large facility called NIF, the National Ignition Facility, which aims 128 laser beams on a little BB-sized pellet inside a little canister called a hole room. And basically, you're trying to get a you know, perfectly spherical implosion with the aim of generating fusion within the laboratory. That's the goal of the National Ignition Facility, is to actually create what's called thermonuclear burn, um, which is interesting for anybody who's in HED, high energy density physics, right? This is the, the mechanisms that, you know, go on at the center of a star as well as in the center of a, of a nuclear weapon, which we're trying to understand without actually having to use them. Um, so the highlights of this simulation, this was a big one. We ran this on the entire Sierra machine just recently. Uh, almost 100 billion elements, which for this code is a lot. This is in what's called an AIL code, an arbitrary Lagrange Eulerian code. Um, so 100 billion elements, that's not a big number if you're a direct Eulerian solver, but for, for an AIL code, this is, this is pretty massive. Um, most of the, the calculation was done entirely on the GPU, so this is pure hydrodynamics, uh, along with a few other physics packages. But, um, and we used uh, a, a uh, Software abstraction we've developed at Livermore called Raja, which is open source, and uh, CUDA on the back end to do this. Um, and then there's some interesting visualization uh, work here as well that, that you'll see. So these are some slides that um, I stole from a talk that's going to be given later this week at the NVIDIA booth if you happen to be there. I think it's Thursday at 1.30 um, as well. And the, the person who did these visualizations uh, will be there to talk in a little more detail about it. But this was a code called ARIES that we used for these ICF, inertial confinement fusion problems. It's a big code, it's 800,000 lines uh, with a lot of different loops and a lot of different third-party libraries. 
So this is not a trivial thing to port to GPUs. So this is why developing some of that underlying software solutions uh, you know, took, took us a long time to do in the form of Raja. Because this code also has to run on non-GPU systems. It has to run on you know, systems at Los Alamos and standard CPU clusters. Um, so again, Raja was our solution there. You know, the timeline for this uh, you know, started back in 2015. Um, I think the first working GPU version was about two years ago, but it's been a very incremental uh, step to get there. And that's, that's one nice thing we were able to do is you know, incrementally hammer down the, the compute intensive parts of the code uh, one by one, sort of loop by loop, uh, converting them and learning along the way and feeding that back into the work that was done later. Um, and so we've gone as far as you know, being able to using some of these abstractions, run calculations on the G CPU and GPU simultaneously. Um, so you can offload some number of MPI tasks to the GPU and keep a couple running those, those cores um, on the CPU, for example. And trying to do all that in a way that uh, is largely invisible to the end user. Um, so we're pretty happy with, with what we're seeing here. And I'll show you some, uh, a movie here in a second. This ran about 60 hours. So that's pretty impressive right there. You can run a calculation for that long. It did require some restarting, um, but uh, all the we, we estimate that Sequoia, which is our large Blue Gene Q system that we've had on the floor since 2012, I want to say, and it was a number one machine back in the day. It's a 1.6 million core machine, but completely homogenous in, in a lot of ways, um, and we estimate that. Uh, basically just running a few time steps and extrapolating enough data, we think it would take about 30 days. So we're seeing a pretty impressive turnaround from 30 days to, to less than three days. Um, and that's why we, we think you know, about 12x faster, um, which is actually exceeding our expectations for this system. Uh, the Viz community as well uh, had a lot to do in this. So you don't have a lot of memory on those GPUs. You want to use it you know, for your calculation. Um, but you also want to uh, try to avoid writing data out to, to a large file system and doing all your visualization you know, post hoc. So uh, we've developed you know, some in situ visualization tools. This is becoming a pretty common solution in a lot of places. We have a product called Ascent, which is part of a project called Alpine. Um, but long story short, all, a lot of the visualization you'll see was done here all uh, in situ or in line with the, the calculation. Um, I think I said all that. So, uh, let's see if the way to click play on here, and I'll walk you through. It's a little bit of a slow movie, but um, so what this is basically saying is we're looking at two fluids mixing in a, in a uh, spherical uh, geometry that's you know under gravity, perfect conditions. Uh, it's collapsing in on itself, and you've got a heavier density fluid on the outside mixing with a lighter density fluid. So it's a classic kind of analytic problem for studying turbulence and that sort of thing. And really, you know, what gets exciting here is one, we can do this in full 3D, right? A lot of times you do this in 2D and you can get some very high resolution results and start to understand more turbulent methods. But, you know, you really need to do 3D to, to fully understand, um, you know, all the interesting features for, for something like this. Um, I think there's a couple different slices here. And it's hard to see on a low resolution screen here, but you know, this was the uh, 100 billion element problem. And we're seeing kinds of detail in this calculation that you just don't get in the lower, uh, lower fidelity type calculations that we've done in the past. And you know, Ascent offers everything. And Visit is the, the post hoc visualization tool. We can do you know, volume rendering very fast on the GPUs. So, starting to use visualization and inline uh, analytics to, to get insight into these you know, types of problems, of which this is just an exemplar uh, at fidelities that, that we've not seen before. So, pretty, pretty exciting for us. You know, the, the HED physicists who are looking at this are starting to you know, posit the kinds of questions they want to answer to not idealize type problems like this, but problems that have real true 3D effects. Um, whoops. Let's see what I do here. Okay, so these are just you know some links to some of the underlying technologies and, and, a, and a summary. 
So let's see, am I doing okay on time? Let me wrap up here. So this I kind of said, this is you know important to uh, not only the HED physicists, but to the weapons physics community as well. Um, in addition to these two applications you just saw, we actually started in 2014 developing a whole brand new application code base with the aim of taking advantage explicitly of these advanced architectures. So we saw that you know, accelerated computing was going to be the way of the future. You know, we wanted to bring our production codes, which have been around for 25 years or more, uh, along. But for mitigation, we also wanted to take a look at what would we do if we had a little bit more of a clean slate. And so the ASC program in Livermore uh, began undertaking uh, uh, some new code development. Our focus here is mostly on high order methods, which are not new in and of themselves, but they're very computationally intensive. So more floating points per memory operation. Um, if you're not memory bandwidth bound, it just means more expensive and it takes longer to get comparable fidelity. But you know, some of the early work we did said you know, computation, memory bandwidth is becoming the, uh, the bottleneck. So if we can do more computation per, per memory fetch, that's going to be a, a benefit to us. So that's, that's a, at a very high level view where we focus some of our efforts. Earthquake modeling is another. I wish I had some movies from this because it's, uh, there's some really cool simulations. Uh, this picture behind this guy, uh, it's, it's the San Francisco Bay Area, but north is to the left, so you know he thinks like a geophysicist and aligns his axis with the fault line, not with north-south. But so it's a little off-putting at first. But once you orient yourself, he's studying what happens if there's a 7.0 earthquake or or whatever on the Hayward Fault outside of the uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And with Sierra, some of the early calculations he's done, he's been able to do some really unprecedented high-resolution runs, looking at you know, high frequencies that are just unable to do on some of the existing machines. And so getting some really exciting uh, science out of this and uh, keep your eyes on some, some uh, publications uh, coming out in the spring for that, we hope. And then just real quick, some other application areas, uh, part modeling, we've done quite a bit of work on engineering and design optimization and structural mechanics, uh, certainly a lot of work in, in material science, which you'll hear probably try to talk more about. Um, so we've, we've begun to push a number of our applications onto GPUs and almost uh, exclusively are, are really pleased with, with the speed ups we're seeing. Um, not everything, Monte Carlo codes, particle tra tracking codes, are still a bit of a sore spot for us, and we're doing some research to figure out how to mitigate that. But overall, I think the GPUs uh, on the system have, have been a big win for us. Uh, we do have an unclassified system that will sit in the open for a long time. It's a much smaller system at, at 20 petaflops, uh, but still a pretty, pretty sizable system. So even when Sierra uh, goes classified, we'll, we'll be able to continue doing uh, open science uh, on, a, on a similar, smaller system. Uh, just real quick, we are starting to look at, you know, how can we use this system to enable more AI? And so this is my, my cartoon about, you know, AI-based computing is really about taking huge amounts of training data and boiling it down into to some sort of insight. And, you know, the opposite flow is HPC, classic HPC starts with a pretty small set of data. And we generate tons of data that we never look at. Right? So we're trying to figure out how can we close this loop. Generate all this data through traditional HPC, use it in training sets, feed that back in, and, and complete the cycle. So I don't have a lot of examples of that, just to let you know this is something that we're uh, very actively pursuing in a number of different areas. So some, we're doing things like, uh, if you're familiar with AL codes or arbitrary Lagrange Eulerian, mesh tangling has been a, a difficulty for those kinds of codes. It requires a lot of user intervention and sort of expertise to make sure uh, the mesh is being managed correctly. So we're trying to use machine learning to, to fix that. Um, you know, a number of different ways, not only using machine learning outside the loop to do analysis, but in the loop, actually integrating it into these simulations to, to create you know, intelligent simulations or cognitive uh, simulations. So I'll just end with a few pictures. Uh, Summit, you'll see, sits on a slab and has all its power and cooling coming in from the top. 
Sierra sits on the second floor with uh, all the infrastructure underneath, so um, that, that's about the only difference in the, the mechanical room aspects of it. Um, so we've got a little bit more uh, um, 48,000 square feet of floor space with, with four feet of now structurally reinforced uh, uh, floor space and then you know all of the uh, mechanical in, in the first floor with a ceiling about this high. So this is what the machine looks like finally all installed and that's with the, the rack off. Nothing too exciting here but I'll end there. I think I hit my half hour so. Yeah, you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. You're you're right up. Yep. Thanks. Rob. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, your uh, your GPU codes. Yep. Uh, are they mostly or all CUDA? Okay. So yes and no. So uh, that Raja layer I talked about means we aren't exposing CUDA directly to the application programmer, and I have a whole. I, I'm happy to talk to you offline about that. But it's basically using C++ meta template programming uh, to allow you to just write standard C++ at the application layer. Behind the scenes, you can target either CUDA, OpenMP, OpenACC, uh, AMD's Rockham, whatever you want. So this is our portability layer. Turns out for a lot of these calculations, CUDA is the most robust tool set. And so we're using that on the back end of it, but it's it typically so you're not using IBM compilers. We are. Oh, you are. So in our okay, how bad was that? What's that? How bad was that conversion? Uh, it's still going yeah. on. Yeah. So our Fortran codes in particular are really dependent on OpenMP4 4.5 for for offload. Um, it's getting much better. There's been a lot of progress in the last six to eight months. Um, we're still using kind of a mix of you know CUDA Fortran and and OpenMP and even CUDA C in some some kernels for these codes, trying to, to understand the you know the performance we should get, and so that the OpenMP code will get there. It's not quite there yet, but it's come a long way, especially in the XL. And my last question is, uh, did you drink Kool Aid like Oak Ridge and go full LSF? And uh, we did. Yeah. For now. Um, yeah, so when we buy, when we procure these big, big machines, we typically look for a top-down vendor solution. Okay. So there's none of this, uh, and LSF is. Well, thank you, you for, uh, thank you for, thank you for, Joe. Uh, no, Mo. <laughs> uh, for slurring. Yes, Mo and Mo and uh, Danny, right? Yes, and Danny. Too. Yeah, that's right. So we got another thing following on to that. You're gonna like even better. So we'll talk about that next time. Any more questions for Rob? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you design your system, how do you, you uh, decide the number of the uh, GPU per core per node? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's tricky. Uh, so we did what we could on some existing GPU-based systems with benchmark codes that we had. Now remember, this was all a lot of these decisions were uh, laid out four years ago. No hardware existed for us to to do any empirical studies. Um, but we did what we could and worked closely with IBM and NVIDIA on this to try to get a best understanding for where the trade-offs were. In our case, the big trade-off was do we want two or three GPUs per CPU? And, you know, I alluded to this earlier, but the, the two GPU solution was uh, largely to make sure that if we weren't 100% successful GPU enabling all our code, you know, we had more nodes, more CPU power to fall back on, as well as if we spill out of memory on the GPU, and we're using you know unified memory to, to transfer. We wanted all the bandwidth we could get. So the two two GPU solution for us, you know, looked better. Um, we've got some benchmark data from IBM using our benchmarks that they ran, you know, compared to the Summit system. Um, and I think you know for us that was the right decision. Not for every code, but overall as a program, that seems to have been the right decision for us. But I would expect, uh, you know, the next machine we buy if it's going to be an accelerated machine. You know we're going to load up on on more accelerators because we're learning as we go and, and getting better at this. So, but benchmarks is really that's all we have, especially because so much of our code base is restricted. So, so you running your uh, benchmark by using single node or multi node? Mostly single node, right? The multi node stuff uh, we weren't too concerned about on this architecture. It's pretty, you know, I mean it's it's a good interconnect, but it's a fat tree. We've got a lot of experience with that. that. 
Um, you know, we had scaled our codes up to you know a million and a half cores on Sequoia, um, which really stressed our scalability at the MPI layer. So we had a pretty good understanding of what we call our outscaling. So how can we scale our codes out to a large number of tasks? For us, it was really about how we're going to go the other direction and get more concurrency out of the node. That was the new challenge for us going from a blue gene Q system to this 180 degree shift, right? And we think we've managed to find a balance where we're, we've got codes that, that run pretty well on both. So, okay. Any more questions for Rob? Okay. All Thanks, right. Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.